Oh my God, this is so good. There's no better feeling than that of being well nourished in body and in soul. We grow vegetables, but to me, we give life. Globally, we produce more than enough food to feed the world, yet millions of children go to bed hungry in the poorest countries and in the wealthiest. So when I walked, I didn't see any grocery stores or anything. We were collecting 50,000 pounds of food waste. Wow. Per week. It's simply not sustainable to produce more than we need and still leave millions in hunger. Are you ready for dirty your yes, hands? Yes, I'm absolutely boy, ready for Okay. But there are solutions. Some are high-tech. It's here for the future. And others are simply about using that most powerful of tools, common sense. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Taste the mezcal and enjoy the moment. It gives people hope. Isn't that what we want? I'm a father to two beautiful daughters. I'm also a husband, a son, a friend, an avid table tennis player, an actor. Jimmy Lannister on the room bike. I'm a human being. As a species, whatever we imagined, we created. We believed the resources of nature were endless. We were wrong. This show is about solutions and the people behind them. My name is Nikolai Costa Waldau, and this is an optimist's guide to the planet. So spread out, this, um, this city. But I guess if, if you went from a million people to 380,000, then it kind of explains it. Yes. And that's what we're talking about. It feels so strange to walk these streets in Cleveland. You imagine that long ago kids were playing, and now it's empty, it feels left behind. What happened here? For some reason, there's so many tires, and I just don't understand it. How do you move forward from this? How do you see past the destruction and instead find the potential, the hope? Randy? Nikolai, how are you this morning? I'm, I'm good, how are you? I'm fantastic. Welcome to Riddall. Welcome to Cleveland, Ohio. We consider this a demonstration site for urban farming. Uh-huh. But the place that we stand in is known as, once upon a time, the Forgotten Triangle. The Forgotten Triangle. The Forgotten Triangle, and that was because this area was the most notorious illegal dumping site in the entire city of Cleveland for decades. Dumping site for what? Any and everything. Burned out cars, refrigerators. Mm. Oh. We worked with the County Illegal Dumping Task Force and unearthed over 2,000 tires. <laughs> wow. Dead bodies. You found dead bodies? Yes. It was all here. So it immediately became an area that nobody could really monitor anymore. There was no sense of community. That doesn't explain urban farming. And also, yes. none of you were farmers. Cleveland, Ohio was the number one epicenter in the country for the foreclosure crisis. It was anticipated that 10,000 homes would be demolished. It turned out to be 18,000 homes that were demolished. Wow. I beg the question, what are we gonna do with all this vacant land? Because this is not representative of my Cleveland. I don't wanna see this in my town. Wouldn't it be nice to repurpose some of it for things like urban farms so that people can have jobs and you can bring life back to neighborhoods? Uh -huh. So my two childhood friends got excited and so we sort of, Super Friends Unite kind of came together and said, let's uh, see what we can do. Kima and myself uh, grew up with a third co-partner, uh, Damien Forche, who suddenly passed away in 2018 from a heart attack. We had the street named in his honor, East 82nd. Oh. See, it's Damien Forche Way. How big is it? How big is it? We started, Nikolai, with 1.3 acres, just this space that you see behind uh -huh. you. 
We have now expanded to all the space behind us, a total of 18 acres. Wow. So it took us 12 years to get to this point. You did say you had to clean this whole place up. It was contaminated. How bad was it? Well, we did have the soil tested when we first got here, uh -huh. and it had high levels of lead and arsenic and all sorts of other really nasty things. Wow. We have to show that these places matter and that we can do something dramatic to, to change the, the community in a positive way. Hoop House 2. But for real change to take root, to be permanent, as many people as possible need to be included. Different generations need to be included. You can see we got arugula right here. And I'll, if you want to taste it. I certainly do. Yeah, it's really nice. Nice and spicy. I'll give you that good farm and table well, experience. That's good. Tell them how you got here. Um, after I graduated, I got caught into um, some troubles with the uh, law enforcement. It was 2014, so I was about 19 years old. Uh -huh. So the judge, he said, you can choose a, a charity or nonprofit to do your community service. First thing that came to my mind was my father's farm, you know, yeah, nonprofit. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, they'll help me out. I won't have to do all the hours that they want me to do. That was my idea in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Feeling your dad was like, yeah, sure. You're going to do all the hours exactly. and more. Exactly. But when I got here, I had changed my mentality because, you know, I was coming from Bedford to the inner cities, and I was like, it looks like I'm seeing walking zombies and the youth have no guidance. Like, why was I doing the things that I was doing? So, you know, I just wanted to kind of inspire the youth, you know, and show them how this was not just a hobby, but a business, agribusiness. The, the, the power of, of, of taking action, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, these guys, three friends, had an idea, and then it's just one step at a time, and, and here you are now. It gives people hope. Yeah. Isn't that what we want? So I've been managing Riddle for about um, three years now, and I learned a lot of regenerative methods so that we don't have to add any chemicals, fertilizers, or pesticides. So when we first started, we were averaging about 1,500 pounds of produce a year. Uh -huh. And my goal was to double that harvest. So two years ago, we were able to reach 3,000 pounds of produce. Oh, wow. But it is worth noting, Nick, that it is of a 28 degree day in February and you still see green things coming oh, out of the ground. That's great. Yeah. The ability to grow year round is very beneficial because when you're living in a food desert, the way that food is distributed through the food terminal. Just explain to me, because I've heard this, this term, food desert. So an individual is supposed to be able to leave their home and within a, a mile, uh, go out within a mile and collect some food and bring it back home. So Riddall being here is like a superhero to the community because most people have to travel two, three miles and take public transportation to get to their food. Sure. And so people are kind of bereft of good, wholesome, everyday nutrition. And so when you live in a food desert, the life expectancy rate is shorter. In Cleveland, the urban cities, people live till about 54 to 64 years old. In the suburbs, 74 to 84. So that's a 20 to 30 year life expectancy rate due to the access to food and other resources. So I can go and, and, and buy produce here, or do you have a, a farmer's market, you said? Correct, we have a farmer's we'll market in Maple Heights where we um, sell produce to that community, and then we have a restaurant where we also cook up the food as well so that they Serve can Serve lunch that. today? Yes, sir. All right, shall we? We shall. There's another layer of this, which is about a part of this city which has been underserved in terms of, of possibilities, opportunities. It's, it's a system created to make it difficult to break those, those barriers, right? To get you know, up in the social ladder, if you will. OK, there's going to be a bump. bump. Did, did you have anything you want me to carry? Yeah, we have something uh, that we need to take in for... Uh... <laughs> Nikolai will take this. It's a box of money. <laughs> Nikolai will take that. I'll take this. Well, welcome to our indoor produce market. Uh, we shop with a wholesale distributor, but during peak season, we can bring everything that we grow at our farm directly to yeah. our market to sell. The store had been here 60-plus years. Oh, wow. And uh, the owner abruptly decided to retire. Yeah and uh, the building closed. Uh, the local mayor stopped uh, by to talk to me and Randy and said, will we consider taking it over? What have, you, what have you changed from what it was before? 
We uh, we hardly we change anything. Except for Chef Cassandra. Yeah, then this is, this is, this is <laughs> What's going on here? This is a great lead. So today I am featuring quinoa. And then I put together a chutney made of pineapple, green onion, and cucumber. Oh, just to delicious. give it a little bit of a flavor. Oh, pop. And we also oh, need that greenery. Uh-huh. And also quinoa is good for your gut health. Oh, I need there that. Yeah. Bon appetit. People. They're curious about eating healthy. They just don't know where to buy it. They don't know what to buy. So when we come here, it's like an educational experience, not just a shopping experience. No. This is good. Yes, thank you. Yes. And what's the philosophy here? Customer service. What does that mean? We got so many customers now, man, we just know them by name, you know? Some of the seniors, they just want to get out of the house. They just want to come in here and talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we're here to listen. Yeah, yeah. You know? So many of our workers are students at our local high school. Yeah. Um, they do a great job. Those two up there. You got and yo see and Dev, I want y'all to come and say hello. Big day. Now he may jump on, he's a big fan of yours, so hey. he's all excited. He... And do you feel what they're saying about like the community? Like they appreciate you guys. Yeah, I do. Being I really here. do. <laughs> That's I nice. Like, I feel like us being here is making such a movement. He's been doing it since he was a teen. Uh -huh. He's come such a long way, and like I can tell, he's very happy. About this. <laughs> does that inspire you? It does inspire me. Do better myself. Uh -huh. Help other people. We're African American businessmen and women. It's proud for our youth to see business owners, and not just employees, but actually owning restaurants, owning uh, a farm, owning a indoor produce also market. Also showing that. Yeah. If you have success in your life, yeah. that's also responsibility. That's right. In order for the community to change, you got to be in the community. You can't change it from outside. Fantastic. Now, speaking of community, I also have to visit a different community, a global one. It includes a bowl and hand-eye coordination. Are you actually rolling that? Of course. Oh, OK. got to roll. you got to roll with it. And what do you know about this area? Uh, pretty much that LeBron grew up here. That's the biggest thing. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Could it be? No, it's not basketball. It's the magic of table tennis. All right, so what are you looking for this 30 minutes? Is there anything specific you want to work or just want to? It's always the same problem. That is surf return. Returning is surf return. OK, sounds good. Sounds good. I'm hoping to learn a few new tricks for the national championships in Greenland. Because this is about the big challenges that we face this show, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the future of the Olympics? Are you hopeful? Are you pessimistic? I think I myself, I always try to be very optimistic about everything, every situation. Even in the moment you feel like, oh, it's very bad, I always try to imagine and see the big picture. No, no, this is what's good for like the growing part, the learning part. There's hope. Up. Yeah, there's hope. And what about my game? Is there hope? Uh, that? No, I'm joking. No, 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 no. there's hope, there's hope. I'm heading back to the folks at Riddle. They prove that anything's possible when people pull together and work towards a common goal. Many people fail in urban farming because you have three or four warm months of weather in a city like Cleveland, and then you have to kind of shut the doors and go away. And so we, we said we have to find ways to make money year round to develop multiple income streams. Uh, this is so, <laughs> it is, it's such a cool project. Something fishy going on here. Oh. How many fish do you have here right now? Probably 75,000. And this is the Red All Aquaculture Facility. Wow. Here we produce uh, tilapia fish. Uh -huh. We use a system called aquaponics. Aquaponics? So, yes. Plants clean uh, nitrates and everything out of the water. Uh -huh. So it's a closed loop. So it's a very sustainable practice. Are you going to catch something now? Yep, we're going to catch some. Yep. All right, let's Might do even it. let you give a go oh, at it. Oh, please, too. Oh, OK, OK. All right, I like that hands-on with me, yep. It's kind of big. All right. I have to do a little jack across. Oh, please. OK. Shit. Oh, we got one. How do you hold it the way, best way? The best way is to grab it all the way from the bottom. Be careful. Don't let them fins get you. 
Ow! Oh, fuck, you bastard. There you go. There you go. Okay. There you go. All right. <laughs> we'll, oh, we'll cut there. We'll cut there. And how much do you sell one of these for? Well, we, we got them going for like uh, 15, like, what is it, 15 99 a pound? Wow. Restaurants are our main buyers. It's the best tilapia you're going to get, yeah. I, I guarantee you. But it really helps tell the story of what's possible in urban settings. You can do this, you can do it anywhere. Oh, that was amazing. We're going to have lunch together, right? Yeah, yeah. You take care of your neighbor. It's that simple. And it just started with three friends coming together and deciding to create a better future for the neighborhood. To feed the people living here in body and in soul. This is, this is for you, sir. Oh, I, I didn't know. Yeah, this is mine. Thank you. Uh, har uh, I guess the, the fish is harvested here, right? Yeah. Mmm. Nice and hot. Oh. Mmm. Oh, that's good. This is just one tiny little part of, 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 of Cleveland. How, what is the potential for urban farming as you see it? I wouldn't want to ask any other community to try to replicate everything that we're doing. No. But people need to understand not only that these uh, kinds of things can happen, but that it's possible in their community. Mm -hmm. One thing is that you care. I think most people care. What does it give you to work here? We grow uh, vegetables and plant flowers and everything. But, but to me, we give life. Most of the veterans were combat veterans. We're pr primarily concentrating on PTSD and suicide prevention. We get light. And I, I mean, I really mean that sincerely because I don't have to be here. <laughs> you know, I don't have to be here. Well, I don't, but I don't think any of you have yes. to be here. And I think and, that's and what's interesting. This is the most, most exciting adventure that I've ever been on. <laughs> and we're just really starting. They had started like wanting to, to make these greenhouses, clean up the place. And by doing these things, all these other things happened. They're doing amazing work for veterans. They're, they're educating kids. They're being role model for other cities. Obviously, they didn't imagine that, but it just shows that a good thing inspires more good things. Three friends transformed a food desert in the middle of a major city into a nutritional oasis. But what about transforming an actual desert? Is that possible? I'm in Mexico to find out. We have to stop here because this uh, dirt road, it gets bumpy. OK. But wait one second here. Alex, I heard that they're going to get a pickup truck to pick us up. OK. Hola. Hola. Are we going to jump up here? OK. It's pretty dry here. Is yeah. that normal for this time of year? It wasn't that bad in the past. Today, over half of Mexico's land is considered degraded or deforested, thanks in part to industrial farming. And in this region, one plant is of particular interest, the agave. It's used to make mezcal and tequila, popular spirits with a global market worth billions of dollars. I'm here to meet Fabi and Diana. They're passionate agave farmers and close friends. For the past 10 years, they've been patiently working to restore this land. Wow. Pues hay mucho por hacer acá, sobre todo esta área como es la más bajita. The agaves is a plant that represents the ecosystem around the agaves. Because when the agaves are wild, the life is there. The mammals, the birds, the reptiles. 
I'm curious to find out how their way of farming is different. So I'm meeting them at one of their fields. And I'm ready to work. Diana. Hola. Ya llegamos. <laughs> Hola. Poco sucio las manos, eh. No, no, no. Estamos aquí say. plantando, mira. You're Diana. Are you ready for dirty your yes, hands? Yes, I'm absolutely boy ready for okay, dirty my hands. Okay, Noé, you need to dig hole and put the gavels and other plants quickly. Okay. Is that how you do it? More, no more deep. Oh, more, uh huh. Yes. Ahí está. That's good. Sí. The problem is a lot of people rent lands like this and put a lot of agaves, and that uh, put more pressure on the soil. So if I go to uh, industrialized farming, I would just see rows and rows and rows of just agave plants. Yes. I keep waiting for this scorpion to just jump out. That's good? Yeah, now we need more water. What is the water? Do you have more water? I can, I can no? certainly go get some water. Okay. <laughs> She's making me work for it. Oh, Jesus Christ, it's all the way up here. Depending on the variety, it can take between seven to 12 years for these agaves to be ready for harvest. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, oh my oh. God. <laughs> wow, what happened, what happened? <laughs> Let's talk about this. Uh, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this film crew that's coming here to do yeah. a story about sustainable well, well, farming. Inside the, the agaves. He, he destroyed probably three years <laughs> <coughs> of our work. <laughs> okay, three years of work. Who was it? So, Fabi, your family, you've, you've been making mezcal in this area for, for how long? Ah, llevamos más de 300 años de produciendo lo que es el mezcal. Eh, nosotros somos la cuarta generación. I must say, I'm, I, I'm expecting this mezcal to be pretty uh, spectacular. Our final goal is not produce massive mezcal, no. It's just produce little mezcal quality, conserve the tradition, and conserve the agaves and the ecosystem around the agaves. So what if I'm a big tequila producer? Uh -huh. And I'm saying, that's very nice, but how am I ever going to get enough uh, product this way? I need to have a lot of agave plants to no, all my this to, is, to kill No, this it. is wrong. Well, it's like we uh, believe in an um, economy decrease if everybody wants to conserve the agaves and so the cocoa. So you're cocoa saying space. if you want biodiversity, you need to accept that you can't have extreme yield. Exactly. Okay. Farming Fabi and Diana's way helps reduce the loss of biodiversity that comes from modern agriculture. Okay, so this is our fountain of okay. water. I will fill it. So this basically, this attracts the animals. Uh-huh. Oh. And we need to help the animals in a dry season. Is that it? Yeah. All it's right. All. Oh, so this is where you put the, the camera. Is it shooting up like this? Yeah. So we put for 24 hours. We watch the videos and we discover uh, hummingbirds. We discover uh, mouses that live and need the flowers of the agave. It's a lot of life around the agave. So all night, bats fly around okay. here and eat. At the farm, they leave 20% of the plants unharvested to help the bats that are natural pollinators. Not just here, throughout North America. The agaves and bats are in bull for 10 million years. And now, with the industry massive of mezcal, one type of this type of bat is in a risk of extinction. So this is really sad and is our responsibility. At the end of the day, they're producing agave to make mezcal. And at harvest time, this farm is yielding massive agaves. So this is yes. for you? Here we go. <laughs> Do you have experience about this, no? No, no, no. <laughs> OK. So you want to do that? Yeah, it's easy. Oh, my god. <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away there. Okay. Silvestre finished. <laughs>
<laughs> Make it the way it's supposed to be. Yes. Well, it's hot enough. Donnie, you didn't say anything about the human sacrificer. <laughs> There's just something about craftsmanship and the, the, the passing of the torch, if you will, from generation to generation. Very inspiring. I mean, the family has done it for 300 years, and now already we have the new generation. And then over here, you see the actual fermentation of the, the batches, various batches. Very cool. We're about to celebrate with a new batch of mezcal and a turkey stuffed with mole. And that means all hands on deck. And then into our nice family is, is at the core of everything they do. I can see why it's so important. You can feel like it really means something. When we say the agave, we think about community, about tradition, about family, about biodiversity and territory. So we enjoy you and everybody here to taste the mezcal and enjoy the moment. So, so what, do you, what, do you, what do you hope for the future? And are you, are you hopeful? Esperas para el futuro. Eh, sí, porque hemos visto últimamente en estos años que cuando nosotros iniciamos eh, nadie creía en nosotros y ahora ya que están viendo cómo hacemos nuestras prácticas hay personas que vemos que ya están haciendo un poquito también de... Fantastic. For the Mexican biodiversity. For the Mexican biodiversity. Yes. And thank you so much for inviting us today. Yeah. Really. Thank you so thank much you. for coming. <laughs> well, that's very good. Like this? Oh, beautiful. Fabi and Diana use their knowledge of the past, of their ancestors, to guide them to a bright future. And a very tasty mezcal. And while they work with their family to revive this land, big farms will have to innovate too if we're going to solve the biodiversity crisis. I'm on my way to a very special farm located just 60 kilometers outside of Amsterdam. Hi, I'm Nikolai. Welcome. All right. Farm of the future. Farm of the future. Yeah. Sounds good. How long has this been, this project been? Uh, been this is now the fourth year. They have just over 200 acres of farmland here at Wageningen University. It's the world's leading agricultural research university, and they're finding better ways for us to farm in the future. We have quite a lot of problems in agriculture. We really suffer from the climate change. Yeah. Problems with pest, uh, pesticides. Uh, that's the strong decline worldwide in biodiversity. And the biodiversity actually is the basis of food production. There yeah. is not one solution. We have to attack everything. Yeah, so I was just inspecting the crop. The first uh, black aphids coming in. Normally, a farmer has to spray, but we leave it up to nature because they will, the spiders and the beetles are all predators of the aphids. They'll, they'll take care of it. So it's a standing army that's already there. Yeah. So I grew up in the countryside, so usually you would have one crop, a whole field, we yeah. all know that, yeah. and this is different. Yeah, totally different. I have uh, eight different crops here. In one field? In one field. Every 100 meters. Flowers. Flower strip. Let's say beetle bank. Yeah. But if you look at over there, eh, you see a monoculture. 30 hectares of, uh, of one crop. Oh, yeah. If you have a lot of individuals that are genetically exactly the same, close together, then and a disease weaker. spreads like crazy. So. Having multiple crops in one field lessens the need for pesticides and helps preserve biodiversity. But to achieve this at scale requires innovation. Actually, the main thing is, is, is a tractor, actually, yeah? but a special tractor that is, uh, is autonomous. You can just hang on different 
whatever machinery you need yeah. to put on. So it has a GPS system, uh, receiving signals, etc. We can also hang under, a, 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 let's say, a, a, a spraying implement, also for autonomy. So what you're saying now, you don't have to have the monoculture because you can have a machine who does works yeah. 24 hours a day, more yeah. or less. That's the idea, is to be able to use crop diversity with new technology. And so, then it, it can actually be sustainable. You would actually... Yeah. Now oh, you see here the windmills? There's quite a few. Yeah. At that moment, we are having a hydrolyzer and we produce hydrogen gas. We have our first forklift on hydrogen gas and next year, first tractor on hydrogen gas. So crop diversity is only one element of this. Eh? Uh -huh. um, uh, the other element is circular agriculture. And is you know what's the biggest hole in our circle uh, for nutrients no. in agriculture? That's your, your hole. I mean... My uh, hole? Human excrements. <laughs> this is what we call struvite. Yeah. It's the phosphorus we won from the sewage plant. Oh, so this is old uh, human shit. Actually, yeah, but it's completely clean. The easy winnable phosphorus in the world will be gone in 100 to 150 years. Oh. So we don't have any phosphorus for fertilization anymore. But so we have to reuse the phosphorus from the humans. Yeah. We do it from the animals, eh? Sure. But from the humans, we don't. How optimistic are you that systems like the ones you're <laughs> working on will be much more commonplace in 10, 15, 20 oh. years? The nice thing is we have a huge interest, for example, of the multinationals. We're doing courses for Cargill, for PepsiCo. We have McCain here. And I see there, in the middle management layer, a lot of young, very enthusiastic people who really want to make a change. So I'm quite confident that we can make a change. So one yeah. final question. How does uh, crops or grass or hedges feel about uh, human pee? OK, you can go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Not on the small ones, on the big ones. <laughs> The way we're producing food has a massive impact on our planet. But what about the way we're cooking it? Charlotte around? Hello? Charlotte? Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, maybe just walk you through what we do here. Okay. Okay. So, how old are you, sir? I'm 29. <laughs> 29, and this yeah. is your business? Yes, this is my business. I designed this stove. So every metal part of the stove is made using recycled metal. So this is what the artisans end up making. So this is, this is the frame? This is the frame of oh. the stove. So this is the inside part, the complete version. Oh, that goes in there? Yeah, that goes in here. So and then you put what's, your pot. What's, what's, is there some, is that just air between? No, no, no. So we're gonna, oh, I'm gonna ah, take you there. Actually, no, let's no, no. go there. <laughs> um, so this is done by female artisans. Uh -huh. And the reason why they're so good at it is because in the villages that we live in here, sure. women are the ones who are responsible for making their homes. So you become very good at molding because you have to make your house prettier than the next house. Okay, so that holds the heat. This holds the heat. It okay. raises the thermal efficiency of a stove. This is what enables families to reduce their fuel consumption. So how, and when you say efficient, how, how much more efficient is this than a traditional stove? This one has about 90% more efficiency. Oh, wow. Do you still make houses or, or not? now you just make stoves? Yes, we make stoves. All right, good. <laughs> Because we're in a rural area and a lot of people do not have cash to buy the stove, they are the products they can exchange for it. Uh -huh. So what they do is they give us their agricultural waste. Okay. We use that to make sustainable fuels and we give them stoves in exchange. How good are these? Um, so these briquettes, um, compared to charcoal, they uh -huh. burn about 15% longer. Oh. Yeah, and um, they cost half the price. Because in rural areas, they collect their firewood. They don't necessarily buy it. No. So for you to sell them a product, even if it's more sustainable, it has to make financial sense to of them. Of course, yeah. yeah. How much can you produce of this? Um, we're still testing that. That has massive potential. Yeah. 
My business is called Mukuru because I grew up in Mukuru. It's one of the biggest slums in Nairobi. Okay, so back when you were young, teenager, to make money, you sold charcoal. Yes. Would that be like like this? Exactly like this. This one seems fancier though. In what way? Um. Well, they have a shop, so. Oh. Yeah. You were just sitting on the street. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were 16 years old. Mm -hmm. You just had a baby. You didn't have any money. You lost your parents. And then what happened? To get by, I got a job from one of our neighbors. He had like a charcoal business. Uh -huh. And he would pay me a um, hundred shillings, so that's one dollar um, a day. But sometimes he would pay me in charcoal instead, because I also had a traditional stove. And then there was something that made you go, there must be a better way to do this. And what, what happened? Um, yeah, so I was cooking and um, my daughter is playing around the house and she knocks the stove and it falls on top of her. And I remove it, like, yeah, quite painful and the skin comes off. Ah. Yeah. After she got better, um, I knew I, I needed to do something about those stoves. But I as I continue schooling, I realized that bans are a problem, but household air pollution is the major problem. Yeah. So this is um, the middle part of Western Kenya. Um, most people here are the ones who use um, open fires because of the rates of poverty and because it's a rural area. Did you down? I said the skuma. Skuma. Oh, so she's cooking vegetables. <laughs> well, first, I'm, I'm Nikolai. Nice to meet you. Uh -huh. Nice to meet you. So, first of all, can you just tell her thank you for allowing us to come here and, and, and visit her? Eh, Rukama no. Aku mienu amondo wa biwali ni wane kaki tedo. Eh, Rukama no. Aye, she says welcome. Is this the way she's always cooked? He chabdi mana higa mange. Yeah, so she's been cooking this way all her life. Eh, koro gilungo anga iron. Yeah, so she says the smoke is very bad and not just for her grandchildren. She coughs a lot as well, so she says it's very bad for her eyes. I was just there for a few minutes, but you could feel it in the eyes. These are the finished products. It goes into the market looking like this. Okay. So, um... So just so I understand, the very basic. Mm -hmm. um, charcoal here. Charcoal there, yes, yeah. And then I do this. I put my pot on top, uh -huh. make my food. Yeah. Done. Yeah. And it is um, try and lift it. It's quite heavy. So that also helps limit the risk of bans. So if a child does that, it just topples and comes back. It doesn't fall over. Uh -huh. So you had the idea mm -hmm. when this thing happens to your daughter. Yeah. Do you keep having this idea all along? So for five years, I had this idea, but I didn't really actualize it, not just because of school, but because I had a child to take care of. Sure. Um, but. In 2017, there's this opportunity for me to learn how to actually be an entrepreneur through an accelerator. Uh -huh. So they give you mentors, um, they just teach you on how to set up a business. Mm -hmm. And so my mom used to sell groceries and I remember she was so good at selling stuff. So I decided to partner with local women business owners and they earn a 10% commission on every stove that they sell. Right. Yeah. So how many stoves have you made? Um, so, so far we've made about two, 220,000. We've distributed over 200,000. The average wage mm -hmm. in, in, in the rural Kenya, how much do people make? So an, um, an average household earns between 40 to $100 monthly income. And how much would, is this for them to buy? So this is $10. Uh -huh. And the other available alternatives that have the same thermal efficiency are $50. So this is 75% cheaper. Yes. Everything is just cheaper and better with this. We could decide to sell it at the same price since it serves the same purpose. But at the end of the day, we're trying to fight household air pollution. And to make that impact, you need to make it accessible to everyone that uh, needs access to it. And you can still make money. It doesn't need to always get higher. Maybe your impact should be bigger, not your salary. Yes. And that's, that's okay too. Can we just please copy that and send it out to all the CEOs of, <laughs> of the world? Your salary doesn't have to be bigger, but maybe your impact could be bigger. You grew up on a, what I would consider difficult circumstance, like being orphaned but at the age of 10, extreme poverty. How did you think that you could just do this? Where did that come from? 
you know that mentality of you can do anything because people are not expecting much from you anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you can just dream as big as you want. You're not afraid of failure because you've seen it. That's good. And it's not that bad anyway. So on our drive to the hotel, I had a couple of thoughts. Most importantly, what's for lunch? And then I wondered what stove the hotel kitchen used. Oh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. I wanted to just talk about just the basic equipment here. So this is gas. Yes. yes. Gas stove. Yes. Yeah. And then what else do you have? You oh. can use this as alternatively. So this is a, a good old fashioned stove. Exactly. This one. Yes. The old one. Yeah, the firewood, right? Yes. And firewood here. This firewood here again. And this one is also another firewood. Okay. I've been doing this story on the on the Mokoro stove. And and what it's doing is it it doesn't have as much smoke. Smoke. Yes. But see, we've never seen it physically. We've never worked with well, it physically. So we don't know much about well, it. Well, let's have a look then. <laughs> <laughs> when we started just as a small kiosk, yes. <laughs> people were so much impressive and that the people who made us now have the energy, motivation now to have the upper floors, and now one after the other, one after the other. And you see now, we will have you here. We didn't know you, we were just knowing you <laughs> probably from yesterday, and now we hopefully will be good friends. Where are we going now? So this is a market, it's called Dory Market. Dory. So yeah, we're going this way. Oh, this way? Yes. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Oh. All right. And we're here. Oh, this is it? Yeah, this is it, but she's there, the seller is over. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello. Ah, there we go. Hey. Bear, bear, bear. Hello. Hello, I'm fine. I'm Nikolai, nice to meet you. OK, so how long have you been selling these? Three years. How many have you sold? 1,100. Oh, so, so this is the official, the biggest one? Yeah, that's a special order for small hotels. <laughs> Good, that's fantastic. I'd like to buy this one. Yeah. That's amazing. And then can I buy, I want to buy one for the lady we met. So which one should she have? Like the medium ring? Yeah, the medium is better. What is all that? So that's um, agricultural waste. You can... Oh, so that's what you want to... Yeah, use. you can exchange that for stoves, and then you use that to make crickets. Then once it's worth a thousand shillings, then you get the medium stove. Oh, great. Okay, so one, two, three... Three thousand five hundred, so this is four thousand. Thank you. Oh, Koro in change, ne? So they, she works in a commission? Yes. So she gets like 10% of, of the sale? Yeah, and she's also a tailor, so this is her tailoring shop. Oh, tailor? Yeah. Can you do me a suit? <laughs> oh, well, maybe I should get a suit. <laughs> so have you ever used charcoal before? I have. Um, to make barbecue? Yeah. So bougie. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's just, it just was really interesting to go and see the the dealership, if you will, of the stove. It's that thing about adapting the business model to what she's trying to achieve, which is to, to actually make this successful uh, in all the households and make a real difference. I think she's ready, but she was like, I never worked with a stove like that. <laughs> but the good thing is, you're the expert. Okay. It's almost the same size. Yeah. You see, this is the biggest one yes. that there that, that is. The biggest in size. Yeah. yeah. So we can just transfer what is there here. Yes, into there, right? Yeah. Is that how you just, why, why am I, I pretend I know, I don't know. <laughs> how much longer does this stay warm compared to that? Um, so this one stays longer for about maybe 60% um, more. Yeah. So you can cook um, maybe twice the amount of meals. Oh, yeah. On the same, on the same charcoal. On the same charcoal, yes. The same quantity. This, yeah. Yeah. Ah, so if you use, yeah. mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> oh my uh -huh. God. Uh -huh. 
Okay, sorry. Can I just see your hands? This is ridiculous. <laughs> what is going on? What? That is incredible. <laughs> what's what's for dinner tonight? Fish. How often this is? This one. Yeah. <laughs> this is Judy. This is my daughter. Yeah. She did law. Yeah. In fact, she, she's waiting to be admitted now. So, in case of anything, we have now the legal team. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yay. Oh my God. She's ready. Thank you. It looks good. We compared the two, and we realized your stove is slightly faster. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, we even tried changing it from the stove to the gas. Yeah. We had to return it back to the stove. Yeah. And here we are. I mean, this is like. <laughs> <laughs> this is good marketing for that us. That is very good marketing. Yeah, yeah, and the fish is great. Thank oh you so much. Oh my God, this is so good. Thank you. Mm. Enjoy your meal. Thank you. This is very tasty. What is the perfect next five years for Mukuru Soaps? So what we want to do is induce mosquito repellents in our sustainable fuels. So as you're cooking, it makes your entire home and the whole vicinity a mosquito repellent that fights malaria. Well, that, that, that would be uh, incredible, though. Uh, why, did, why can't I get it all off? No, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm better at it, because I've been doing this all my life. I'm competitive, too, so I, I'm not going to accept <laughs> that. that you just... It needs to be a skeleton that can go into a museum. Okay, well, let's just see where you are in, in five minutes. <laughs> oh, no, it broke. See? I ah. win without even finishing. <laughs> no, but you can win if you don't finish. <laughs> The world needs more empathy. And businesses understand that you need to have a social aspect. They cannot just be about the profit. So yes, you could say that the world needs more shawls, but it needs more of all of us. Bye. Bye. Bye.